Hey everybody, welcome to It's Real with Jordan and Demi. Our guest today is probably the greatest composer in television history. His iconic themes include Law and Order, NYPD Blue, Hill Street Blues, LA Law, Rockford Files, Magnum PI, and The A-Team. He has a new album out. Please welcome Mike Post. How you doing, Mike? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much. So before we get into the TV music, let's talk about the new album. I was listening to it last night and it kind of reminded me of Aaron Copeland or something like that. And I, I think this is actually your first album ever of original material, or at least it's your first album in a really long time. Why did you decide to make this album now? So uh, to, to, to play musicologist for a second, it really starts with the Warjack at the end of the 1800s, right? He comes to America with a reputation as being a guy that makes symphonies or large concert pieces out of folk melodies from Eastern Europe. So he gets hired by the, by the New York Philharmonic and the people that support that uh, because American music isn't anything, you know, it's nothing. So let's get a European to come uh, conduct and write for the New York Phil, which he does. But uh, he becomes friends with a mixed race uh, viola player, I believe, in that orchestra. And the guy says to him, hey, maestro, uh, you really ought to travel the West and the South uh, on our time off. Because there's really a lot happening in this country musically that, that, these, uh, that the intelligentsia of New York City at this point in time in 1895 or 6 or whatever it was, they don't see value in, but there is. So Dvorak packs up his kids and his wife and he jumps on a train and he jumps on a stagecoach. And he, and of course he takes paper and pencil with him and he starts making notes and he starts hearing all this music and going, man, this is fabulous. This is fantastic. He comes back and in three months time, he puts together a thing called the new world symphony. And he performs it, and some idiot uh, mm -hmm. uh, reviewer, you know, critic, says in the New York Times, it's not so much that he that he steals all these melodies because he's always done that that he takes folk music and makes symphonies out of it, but he chose the Negro and Indian melodies, which are inferior music, to do this with. And he writes back the next day, you idiots, you idiots. You don't even know what's sitting right in front of your eyes. Right at home, you have the basis for many, many new genres of music. So in eighteen late 1890s, a guy from Poland, you know, comes over here and discovers the building blocks of the blues, pop music, gospel, you know, uh, bluegrass, country. I mean, he just discovered the whole thing. So, yes, yes. After that, 20 years later, 30 years later, a guy named Aaron Copeland shows up and goes, okay, let's keep going with this stuff because it's great. And let's make big pieces out of these licks because that's what they are. They're little tunes, okay? And they sound simple, but they move mountains of emotion. As we all know, we all bathe in this in this giant pool now that was started by, in quotes, the Negro and Indian melodies. So, you know, for me, the way this piece, these two pieces, they're really two pieces. The, the way it happened is COVID beached my shows. So I'm, okay, hey, I don't have any work to do. Well, I'm used to that during... The summertime, because I my gig is like a teacher. I work from September to through May, and then I'm done. You know, right. so but all of a sudden, COVID beaches me in the middle of the year, and I go, well, okay, all right, I guess I'll just you know do other things. And then I'm driving uh, in my my Tesla, which basically means I'm monitoring, <laughs> and I'm down a Spotify bluegrass hole that I hadn't quite been down, you know. And I'm going, man, this is great. I I hadn't heard that, and I hadn't heard this. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me that I hadn't done anything uh, 
well, it didn't dawn on me yet. What, what dawned on me was, I wonder if anybody's written a, a concerto for a bluegrass band, five-piece bluegrass band, and, a, and an orchestra. And I thought, well, well, that'd be really hard. That would be extremely difficult. And the reason it's difficult is bluegrass players traditionally don't read and orchestras don't jam. Wait a minute, how, how the hell can you let those two things talk to each other? How can they, how can they live together? So I started thinking about it. I'm driving and I went, wait a second. Just because it's hard and just because it's never been done, you're the guy that did classical gas as a 23-year-old, you know, and won your first Grammy for it and blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, you haven't done anything that scared you in 30 years. You know, all I've been doing oh. is what I always do is score television, right? And I thought, why don't you get off your lazy ass and 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 do something difficult? So I, I didn't tell anybody I kind of told my wife I got my and I did it the old way. I got my drafting board out and I got pencils and score paper and I started just writing and I didn't touch a computer. I didn't, you know, nope, not nope, going to do it this way. And so I put together four or five little chunks, little pieces of it. And I took it to, to a young friend that's been working with me for a long time. That's a a, pretty much a genius. And I said, John O'Hara, look at this. Do you think this is any good? And he goes, well, wait a minute. What is this? And I told him, he went, oh God, let me work on this with you. Please let me. I said, of course. So we mocked up some stuff, just these chunks. Then I called up, in my opinion, four of the best bluegrass players that I've ever met, you know, that live out here and that I have history with. And I said, you know, I got this, I got this, I got this idea. Uh, could you guys help me with this? And they said, sure. So they came in and played some stuff. And then I went back and reorchestrated. And then I played that to them and they played differently. And, and so we had this back and forth conversation. And I realized early on, that if this works for a bluegrass band and an orchestra, this is going to work for a blues band and an orchestra. So not only did I get my lazy butt going, but I I, I got really enthused about it from an artistic standpoint. I, I just, I didn't know whether anybody's going to like it or care about it or anything else like that. It wasn't for that. This was for a different reason. You know, it's like, okay, this hadn't been done exactly this way. Um, and I'm going to do it. So that's what I did. After COVID broke, uh, then I could hire an orchestra and I hired a huge, you know, 80 plus pieces, put them in the Sony scoring stage for two days and conducted again. And and I I really like how it came out. I know it's different and it's odd. And I, I knew right away I was going to piss off some bluegrass people and some blues people. And I knew I was going to piss off a lot of legit people that go the same thing that happened at Dvorak. Oh, you know, why are you putting the orchestra with this stupid music? You know, well, sorry, <laughs> that's what I'm doing. So how did all this start? Did you always want to write music for TV? What kind of shows did you watch growing up? I was, you know, I was raised on the television and raised on the radio. I loved, you know, Peter Gunn, and I loved, like, all people my age, Maverick and Sugarfoot and, and Wanted Dead or Alive, and, you know, it was all Steve McQueen, and, you know, I was very moved by war movies, you know, and, and The Great Escape, and, you know, all that stuff. So I I grew up on, on, on TV, on radio, on movies of of the 50s and 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 early 60s so yeah and and really my job jordan honestly uh, it starts with the theme but i've scored every episode of all the law and orders i've you know scored i mean i do every show every week so you know what my real day job is not the themes my real day job is scoring every episode of these shows that I do. So how did you end up writing music for TV? Did, did you have a connection with somebody or, or how did that happen? It, it kind of happened naturally. Each part of, of my extremely fortunate journey here, 
life started as a musician, right? So playing in clubs, playing uh, playing rock and roll in clubs as a pianist, then playing folk music as a guitar player on the road in folk clubs and and on tours. That transitioned to being a studio musician as a guitar player. So I played on my first hit record when I was 19, which was I Got You Babe with Sonny and Cher. And I did all their stuff. And then I am, um, I am, I'm an addict. I'm, I'm, I'm addicted to accomplishment musically. Uh, it has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with anybody knowing me or knowing my name or certainly my face or anything like that. I, I'm addicted to doing weird new stuff musically. So for a year, I was very satisfied to be part of this highly recognized group of musicians called the Wrecking Crew. Okay, I'm I'm in. I'm it's me and there's Glenn Campbell, there's Tommy Tedesco, there's Hal Blaine. There, you know, hey, I'm in. I'm playing, and they like my stuff. You know, and after a short time, I'm looking around and I'm going, well, that's not what the strings ought to be doing. That's not what the bass part ought to be. You know, and I'm going. Wow, you, you know, you should be, you were scared to death, you know, three months ago, and now you're trying to, you know. So uh, I became an arranger. And right away after I'm learning arranging on the job and out of books, I realized that I needed to produce the record because the producers were changing my arrangements. And so to protect the music I was envisioning, I became a record producer. Well, I had my first hit record as a producer when I'm 21. Just dropped in to see what condition my condition was in. Uh, Kenny Rogers in the first edition. And then six months later, eight months later, Classical Gas. And that led me, Andy Williams is going on the air at eight o'clock. He needs a young guy. I'm 24. Okay, well, I wasn't really educated as a conductor or anything but yeah i can do i can start him and stop him yeah sure he needed a young guy on camera with him for the concert section and that led to uh just to this expanded sort of horizons of like uh, you know i had my dear friend pete carpenter we weren't partners we were just friends and he was of another generation and he said hey you think arranging is great wait until you start with blank paper and you become a composer for film or television. And I went, really? That's fun? He goes, oh, it's just the nuts. I mean, it's perfect, you know? So that's how it all, that's how it progressed. Conversation um, with a friend um, about kind of just like that same addiction that you were talking about. It seems like almost every like iconic person, whether you're thinking of like, I don't know, Kurt Cobain, or Michael Jordan, right? Mm -hmm. They just had this addiction to to be better and and uh, trying new things, but most importantly, just not following the rules and stuff like that. So I find it interesting when you say that you have this addiction to trying new things and pushing the the mold when it comes to music. Um, where do you think that addiction comes from? Like, what was it that kind of sparked that inside you? I am honestly the luckiest guy you'll ever do a. A, a podcast with the luckiest guy you'll ever meet <laughs> because uh, I had great parents and a great brother that were uh, older brother that that were so supportive and so um smart I'm obviously eight I'm obviously ADHD I'm I'm dyslexic okay uh but if I can hear it I'm I'm pretty good. You know, if you can teach it to me, you know, uh, through words or music or, you know, by talking to me, okay, I'm probably not going to forget it. You know, reading it was very difficult. So I was a terrible student, right? Um, but I didn't feel bad about myself, you know, because I believe my mom and dad, who were both college graduates, and you know, my father was an architect, kind of you know, super bright, my brother, super bright, my mom, triple bright, you know, I mean, and, and they're telling me, oh, no, no, you're not dumb. Oh, no, you're smart as hell. It's, it's just mm -hmm. you're different, you know, and they didn't have words for it. There was no word for dyslexia. They're, oh, your eyes skip around. We understand. 
but you never forget anything you hear. And look at what you can do with a piano and you're six years old. You know, I mean, come on, you're going to be fine. You're fine. You just got to find something you, you know, look, when I don't know if journalism is what moved you, right? I don't know if it was, I don't, if it was somebody doing a great interview that moved you, but for me, it was so simple. It was music. It was just that thing. I got to know how to do that. I got to know what that, what, what are the, what's the architecture of that? How do you, how do you do that? And it made perfect sense to me. My math skills are pretty good. And that, and music is simple, simple math. And it just made sense that F is to C is B flat is to F. And I went, Oh, and there's 12 different of them. And, and the 13th one's an octave. Oh my God, this is it. And then I heard Bach and I went, oh, well, there it is. You know, I mean, th that's it, you know. So, you know, and then I heard B.B. King and Freddie King and Albert King. And I went, <laughs> oh, OK, this is the deal. Once I swam in this stream, it led me to the river and the river led me to the ocean. And I just kept swimming. I'm still swimming. I... I'm t this is I know this sounds corny, but I'm going to tell you the truth. You can't play me anything I don't understand intellectually, musically. You can't play me anything. I've, I I honest I'm going to be 80 in a few months. I I've, I've been doing this since I was 6. Okay. It all makes perfect sense to me. I don't know the first thing about it. It's fucking magic. It's magic. How does it do what it does emotionally? How does it make me and you and everybody else feel the way we feel? It's it's magic. And it's still magic to me. So, you know, all those things that have been said a billion times that they're cliches, you know, the whole conduit, the whole, I don't know what I was thinking, you know, all that stuff's said a million times because it's bloody true it's true what were you thinking when you wrote hill street blues well i don't know i, I was thinking about the pilot i just saw and it took me 30 minutes to do it wait wait, wait a second you, you wrote you wrote the theme to hill street blues in only 30 minutes Bochco called me we we're friends we had we had worked together with steve cannell on a, a little short-lived spinoff of Rockford called Richie Brockelman, Private Eye. And and uh, Bochco called me and said, hey, can I send you a script? And I said, sure. So I, I read the script and I go, wow, this is like, there's nothing on TV like this thing. And he was, yeah. So he shoots it and a guy named Greg Hoblet directs it. Really talented dude. And they have me over to CBS Studio Center, which is literally... Uh, in North Hollywood, literally, you know, eight blocks from where I was living at the time. And I go, I go sit in a screening room with a bunch of people and I see the entire pilot. And I go, my God, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Go back and watch the pilot again. It's amazing for 1981. It's amazing. So we go up to Bosco's office, there's a bunch of people there. and But him and Hoblet are the guys. They really are the guys I got to please. And I said, what's the music sound like, you guys, in your head? What do you think? Well, hell, if we know, we don't know. And I said, well, Greg, what's going to happen during the main title? What's what's going to, he's well, the, a garage door is going to come out. A prowl car is going to go out. It's going to be rainy, sleety, bombed out, South Bronx, Detroit, you know, anywhere East Coasty, Midwest, tough, really funky. And the car is just going to, patrol through this crap you know i went oh Bosco goes what does that sound like i well it could sound like stevie wonder you know kind of funky and and dirty and you know kind of cool and he goes well what else could you do and i said well given the pilot i just saw that is absolutely stabbed me in the heart while making me laugh um you could do something different. You could do something kind of poignant and and sort of 
just like the, hey, babies are going to get born, people are going to die, and the clock's going to keep rolling around, and that's life, guys. And I went home, and they and Bosco said, yeah, do that. That sounds different. And I went home, and I was immediately in E-flat, you know. I mean, I was right there. And I went, oh, what the hell is that? I don't, that's pretty good, you know. I'm, you know, I'm, oh. Yeah, well, that's pretty good. You know, oh, yeah, okay, I'll do that. I mean, literally 30 minutes. I call him up, and Bochco, his first line to me was, hey, I don't want something you pulled out of a trunk that you did for yourself. I said, I don't have a trunk, except in my head, you know. I mean, I don't do that. You better come over. You better listen to this damn thing. He walks in the door with Hoplet. I play it. He goes, play that again. I play it. He goes, that's my TV show. That is my television show. Exactly. I want you to play it. Don't change a thing. In fact, I want it to just be piano. I went, shut up. Calm down. I know uh -huh. you're excited, and I'm flattered that you are. But calm down. It, it could be a little more. It's a small rhythm section. I've got a guitar player, a friend of mine named Larry Carlton, young guy who's a genius. I'm going to get him, see what he thinks of it. There's some fills that need to happen around it. I'm going to put a small string section over the top of it. He goes, all right, but don't screw this up because I love just hearing you on this piano. I said, don't worry about it. And so, you know, we went ahead and accomplished it. And he really liked it. And I guess it meant something to some people. This is just a random, like, nerdy question, but if you could just have one, um, if you could write in one key, like, from this point on for, like, the rest of your life, like, you can only, you have one key to write in, which one would it be? Would it be flat? You know, I'd probably say G, just really? because it sits so well on the guitar, and and my late partner, Pete Carpenter, you said, you know, when we were answering, when we were asking that question of each other in, in context of doing, when you do a show, you don't want all the cues in one key. You want to keep cycling so it doesn't, you know, so it has a different feeling to it. He said, uh, today, uh, this cue is in God's key. This will be in G. You know, oh, we laugh. And so, you know, so G. Yeah, G. I love G. God's key. There's no key I hate, by the way. I mean, they all, they all kind of... Uh, I don't know. They all sort of hit me weird, you know, differently. But but yeah, G. When you compose a theme, what do you have to work with? Do you have a batch of episodes or just the pilot or a meeting with the producer? How, what do you have to start with? What do you have to go off of? I've had three really close friends that are creators, producers. Hmm, let me think. Stephen Cannell, Stephen Bochco, Dick Wolf. Uh if you happen to be their composer, if they, if you got them positioned so that they think you're really good at this crap, you know, it's like, oh, well, then you're going to be Mike Post. Then you're going to have, then you're going to have 7,200 hours of television that you've done the music for, if you can keep going that long. And so, you know, lucky, lucky, fortunate, unbelievable. So a lot of the time, Cannell would call me early in the morning because he started work at 536, and I start early. And he'd go, hey, you got a second? I go, yeah. And he goes, I want to tell you a story. You know, and the stories would be really crazy. Like, so this guy gets wrongly convicted, and he goes to jail for a couple, three years. He gets out, and, he, and he's... He lives in a house trailer in Malibu or in a Paradise Cove. Let's say Paradise Cove in Santa Monica. And he becomes a private eye and he drives a Firebird. And his name's Rockford. Okay. I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it a lot of times it started like that. Sometimes it starts with just script like L.A. Law. They send me a script. All right. And I read the script and I go, okay, well, okay, I, you know, let me figure this one out. Um, I, I One of the coolest, oddest, weird things was NYPD Blue. So 
we hit a home run with Hill Street. He hit a home run with uh, L.A. Law, Doogie Howser. You know, same guys, Bochco and, and Hoblet. We're doing great. I mean, we're killing it. So they write this script, NYPD Blue, uh, Bochco does, and and uh, I think with David Milch. And it's, man, it's so good. I can't believe it as a script. It reads like a novel. It's fantastic. So I asked to get together with Hoblet and Bochco, and we meet at a restaurant. And so they're ordering and they're ha laughing and, you know, and we're all very close friends. And I go, are, are you two geniuses ever going to want to talk about music at this? Or are we just going to talk about whitefish or, you know, roast beef or whatever? The, <laughs> and and Bochco says, well, I, I do have a lot to say. And I go, and I, I know they're busting my balls. I know that, you know, that's what we do to each other. I go, okay, what? He goes, has there ever been a main title that was just drums? Oh my God. I go, no, Stephen, there, there is not. I mean, there's the opening to Hawaii 5 you know, <laughs> but no, there hasn't been, and there can't be. That's not the way we do this. He goes, well, that's all I was thinking. I go, oh, fantastic. This is great. These are my best friends, you know. I said, what about you? I look at Hoblet, and he goes, well, I've been thinking about subways. I went, what? He goes, yeah. He, if you look at Manhattan and the surrounding boroughs as a body, the arteries and the veins are the subway. Yeah. I went, wow, that's an odd observation. Wow. And I'd already read a couple of books that, that they suggested, that Hoblet suggested about the history of the NYPD. So I knew the history. I said, so you're going to say drums and you're going to say Subway, the two most decorated guys in television. That's what you're going to say to me. I got it. I know exactly what to do, you idiots. Yeah, we thought you would. I said, drums, subway, I got it. I know what to do. And then I said, it's going to take me a while because it's hard. And so what I did was I went back to my studio and a, and a young man was working with me named Danny Lux, who's become a great TV composer on his own. Uh, you know, Grey's Anatomy, but, uh, you know, Ali Veal, blah, 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 blah. And, I, and, and Danny was a drummer. I said, look, you remember the Phil the greatest rock and roll drum fill in the history of the world is in the air tonight, Phil Collins. But that, da 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 right? That fill just kills everybody. I said, we got to beat that sound of those toms with reverse gate echo and blah, blah, blah. So we, that's the first thing we did. And the second thing we did, I said, I got to make a groove out of a railroad, uh, out of a train on a train track. Tick, look, tick, back, look, tick, look, tick. So we did that. And because because of my research and because of my girlfriend at the time, not yet married to her, Patty McGettigan, pretty Irish. That's pretty Irish. Okay. Um, and because the first cops in New York City were all Irish because they could fight. And that's... So I said, oh, we're going to do this middle section and we're going to make it Irish as hell because I love that music anyway. And it's it's heartwarming. But the whole first part and the last part is just going to be massive drums and massive subway train sounds. So I know you're probably sick of it, Mike, but we have to talk about the law and order theme. How did you compose that? Did you have a lot of instruction? Was there something specific that inspired it? How did you compose that that song? Number one, I'm not sick of it at all. I'm not sick of talking about it at all because it's so crazy. And it's so, it's, it tells you the theme part of my job. It, it, what I just told you and, and, and what I'm going to tell you, the real answer is, hey, what do you do for a living on the theme side? What is that job really? Well, it's code breaking. Because these guys that are really smart and creative and just blank paper guys. Hey, what if, what if they say this? What if the characters do this? You know, 
they come to me and they speak in English and they expect me to figure out what that means musically. So I break the code. So the code for, for Law and Order never saw a script. Dick had pitched me the idea uh, over a drink and and it's a long story and I won't bore you with the whole thing, but but I'll I'll truncate it a little bit. He he's so he's such a great writer. This guy's so smart and and so talented, massively talented dude. So uh, I, he said, I'm not even gonna show you the script because we're we're doing a pilot right away. And you know, he shows me the pilot and I go, Oh my God, this is this is the weirdest looking thing. This is fantastic and he goes yeah and i said so what's the music he goes hell if i know i don't have the faintest idea and i said oh come on and he said well it, you can see it's all it's steam coming out of manhole covers it's it's slick streets you know in manhattan it's 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 almost a documentary isn't it i said yes it is and he goes so look he said it's also the majesty of the law because the second half of the thing is all in the court. And I went, yeah, yeah. He goes, I don't know what it is, but it's got to define New York City because we're not going to shoot a frame of it outside in New York. And I went, Dick, I hate to tell you this, but that's already been done. A guy named Gershwin, you know, George Gershwin, he it's got Rhapsody in Blue, it defines New York City. He goes, oh yeah, just do that again. I went, oh, fuck. you know, <laughs> I mean, mm. you know, talk about showing me Mount Everest and saying, here, just match up to that. You know, I don't. So I just bought a new Stratocaster, uh, uh, not a Fender, a, a Kramer Strat. And I was messing around with it. And I was doing this thing where you pull the strings rather than pluck the strings or pick them. Uh, you, you pull them and snap them. And I was going, bap, bap. And I'm playing sort of like sort of Freddie King ish, you know, and I'm messing around. And I'm, and oh, by the way, I'm in G minor. Okay. But, you know, yeah, right, right, right. So, you know, and I'm thinking, well, sure. I'm a little electric piano, you know. Ooh, wait a second. There's something there. That's kind of neat. Yeah. So I get the whole first part of this thing. The A section. And I go, oh, fuck. He wants me to define New York City. What am I? Well, clarinet. I'll just steal the idea of a clarinet, you know, from George Gershwin's idea of Rhapsody in Blue. I'll just use a clarinet along with this pretty funky little guitar thing. So I, I have him over and I said, well, here's what I think. And he went, wow. Wow. Okay. Don't change nothing. I went, okay, we're done. So that's how, the, how, except, except the bastard calls me up on the third day of the dub where they mix effects. It's at the end. We're done. He calls me. I go, is everything okay to you? I mean, is something not working well in the score? You know, and the, there wasn't much score, but what there was, I thought was pretty good. He goes, oh, no, no, you did a great job. He goes, but I've decided that every time we change scenes, in mean, some scenes that change locales, I'm going to date stamp it and 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 say where we are. I said, well, oh, that's, that's a good idea. It's more documentary-like. He goes, right. He said, so I need a sound for that. I go, great. Call sound effects. I'm your composer. I don't do sounds. I do music. Oh, come on. God damn it. Why do you bust my balls this way? Come on, help me out. Well, he said the magic word, help me out. Yeah. So I went, oh, God, Dick, I thought I was done with this. I got other things to do. He goes, no, please, I need your help. All right. So me and same kid, Danny Lux, we're banging on stuff. We, we get a sample of a jail door slamming, a sample of a bunch of men stomping on a gymnasium floor in, in Japan. We get a sample of uh, a guy hitting a anvil with a hammer with a steel hammer you know we and we hit on some drums and we make a bit we it takes us about six hours to get chang chang clung clung ching ching whatever the hell you want to call it i send it over to the dub stage he goes 
perfect. I never heard anything like that before. That's great. Out of all the TV theme songs you've written, what's your favorite? Do you, do you have a favorite? It's a, you know, I don't, I don't really have a, a, a favorite. I have, you know, I'm not even sure that, that my themes, I'm, that I'm, I'm sure that my themes aren't my favorite themes. You know, I go back and I listen to Mancini did on Peter Gunn or what, or, or, or what Dave Grusin did on, on St. Elsewhere, you know, and I, or what, or what the original wild, wild West theme was so good, you know? And I, I mean, I look up to other guys. I don't look at, I don't look at my stuff and go, Oh my God, look what I did. You know, I just don't feel that way. And by the way, I have to tell you, I've never in all the interviews I've done for this project and other projects and all that, no one's ever asked me my favorite key. That was, that was great that somebody uh, asked me what my favorite key was. All right, Mike, thanks for being on the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys very much. It was really nice to meet you. And thanks for having me. All right. That was the legendary composer, Mike Post. That'll be it for us. As always, go to popdust.com for the latest in pop culture and music news. Follow me on Instagram at Jordan Edward Studio. Follow Demi at Demi underscore Ramos. Follow the show account on Instagram at Demi and Jordan underscore. And on TikTok at It's Real with Jordan and Demi. 